Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that a comparison of blood samples from the 1950s and then those same kind of blood samples from today show that celiac disease isn't just a fad, it's four times more common now than it was 60 years ago. Yeah. Now there's reasons, there's junk food, there's stress, there's all sorts of environmental things we've done. But one thing that is well documented is that a substantial portion of people, way more than half, who have celiac or Crohn's have detectable mycotoxins in their blood. So there's a high correlation and there's some cases where we can show causation, but we can't show 100% causation. So it's interesting that something you breathe through your nose may be contributing to gut problems. Kind of funky. Today's guest is Tom Maltair. Tom's an advanced functional medicine nutritionist with 10 years of clinical experience and a couple degrees. He's also a faculty member at the Autism Research Institute, and he teaches physicians and other practitioners about stuff like the microbiome, chemical exposures, nutrient deficiencies. And he and his wife, Alyssa, have written two gluten-free cookbooks, and they were gluten-free before gluten-free was cool. <laughs> so, Tom, welcome to the show. Hey, it's an honor to be here with you, Dave. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Uh, we first met at... Uh, uh, at JJ Virgin's event. Um, she's a, a mutual friend of ours and she tends to pull together interesting people who are doing things that a lot of people just haven't heard of who are really working to to move the needle mm -hmm. for, for big numbers of people. Right. Yeah. So I wanted to talk to you because you're looking at gluten and, and there's been this, uh, we'll call it the gluten-free backlash. And, and what they say, anytime there's a, a big scientific paradigm change. The mm -hmm. first thing that happens is uh, they make fun of you, then they try and discredit you, and then it was their idea all along. Right? <laughs> and so the making fun of gluten thing, we've already done. Yeah. Okay. And it's gone past that. And mm -hmm. a third of the countries like read a little bit of research or heard about this mm -hmm. and is now working on eliminating or at least reducing gluten because it has bad stuff in it. Sure. That's a scientific thing. And you know, bad stuff, TM. And <laughs> um, that said, though, now there's this, this recent study where people say, mm, it turns out only people with celiac disease should care about gluten. Everyone else should rub it on their skin, you know, eat it by the pound. Inhale it. And, yeah. yeah. So I wanted to talk with you specifically about, you know, why there, why there might be this backlash and, and how you would respond to that as a functional medicine nutritionist. Oh, yeah. So uh, tell me about that. Like, like, what's your take on celiac, given that you work with autistic kids and all that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, that's part of my practice, right? But I, I myself have gluten sensitivity reactions. I have, and in fact, since 2004, recognized that, but I've had it pretty much my entire life. The reality is, Dave, people are down on what they're not up on, right? As part of the uh, functional medicine team, you know, you're taught by David Permletter. And he, that's a phrase that stuck with me way back in 2007 when I was learning from him. So, so you, you studied with David Permletter? Oh, well, he was part of the faculty of I of M. So yeah, I've been going through all the trainings for over the years. Yeah, I've, I've okay. been influenced by David quite a few times. And people who are listening should just know David Perlmutter wrote one of the two main books about gluten. He wrote... Uh, grain Brain. Uh, grain Brain. I always confuse Grain Brain and Wheat Belly because they're both yeah. like yeah. names that sound kind of the same. Yeah. But um, he wrote Grain Brain and he's a, a really good brain guy in general. I've been reading Perlmutter's books, including his book with Alberto Viotto for, for many years. Yeah. So just yeah. know he's kind of a luminary in the field. So go ahead. Yeah. So this phrase, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it from him, and I use it all the time. Uh, people are down on what they're not up on. So when you hear someone who comes in and says, you know what, gluten is a fad. This is a trend that's going to go over time, and this is not a big deal, and this is whatever they're going to say about it. Immediately, I say to myself, oh, that's, that's an ignorant practitioner. That's a person who's <laughs> not, or, or a layperson, who is not looking at people daily in their clinical mm -hmm. practice, walking in through the door, who are pre-gluten-free diets having arthritis and migraines and all sorts of skin disorders and mood issues, or in the case of children, you know, perhaps autism or ADD, ADHD. And then when you take out gluten and perhaps other foods like dairy or yeast or, or corn or, or, or uh, eggs, whatever it's going to be, they turn around their entire disease process. Their entire disease process, I don't care if they had chronic migraines or arthritis or attention deficit, whatever it is, if you can take those foods out of their life for a minimum of two weeks, preferably about 28 days plus, then what happens is their intestinal tract is no longer irritated by those foods. 
their immune system calms down and you'll see this mental acuity come back in people, this energy level come back in people. You'll see the skin clear up. You'll see the behavioral disorders melt away as if they were never there to begin with. So when someone says this doesn't exist, and I've been witnessing it for over 10 years in my clinical practice, I just say, oh, well, you haven't seen it yet. Who are you believing? I don't know. The media? Are you looking at a selective amount of research studies? Because there's a drastic, you know, 20,000 plus studies on gluten associated reactions and other foods as well. There's something called cow's milk protein enteropathy in infants. There's a, a soy enteropathy. There's all these different disorders that all you have to do is look and you'll find them. So I just say, hey, you know, educate yourself. That's all. When I, when I hear someone say, you know, there, there's no reason uh, that you should avoid gluten unless you're one of the things, I, I just kind of shake my head. I'm like, like <laughs> it, it's so, the studies are so clear. There's so many of them yeah. um, that, that overcoming that, that gap, I think it's just going to take time. Um, but I, I hope that the packaged food industry who makes a lot of money from this mm. really uh, doesn't just kind of push that message so hard that they just kind of brainwash people. Because yeah. I, I tell you, once you're on gluten, you want more of it. And can you explain <laughs> the mechanism for why people tend to you know, not, not have just one cookie? Well, you know, that's, that's such, well, there's quite a few uh, mechanisms, but for the sake of time, let's talk about one in particular. And so, for example, I, I recommend elimination diets all the time in clinical practice. And so I, I ask people to take out, at the bare bones minimum, the two most reactive foods for human beings. And those are gluten and dairy. And Shocking. So, yeah, right? So those specific foods, if you look at them, have these opioid-like peptides in them, those uh, gluteomorphins, caseomorphins, these, these things that actually bind to the same receptors in your brain that opium does. Okay, so these opioid-like peptides, when you're consuming these foods, will give you a drug response. They will sedate you and they will form an addictive pattern in your biochemistry where you will crave more. So the example I give is, you know, I mean, come on, you, you hear about Oprah, you hear about Kim Kardashian, they go on the elimination diets all the time. They're trying to lose weight and feel fantastic. And the one thing they say is, you know, I'm craving cheese. I'm craving bread. The two yeah. foods, the two foods that have the highest level of these peptides. In fact, you know, it's fascinating, right? We know if you have kids, and I have, I have five, if you have kids, then when the kid is like totally uncontrollable, inconsolable, what does the mom do? She breastfeeds them, right? They know that that milk contains these peptides, peptides that will, you know, <laughs> cause them to roll their eyes back and then, blah, 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 you know, they fall asleep. Yeah, sure, it's the physical cuddling and whatnot, but it's also this biochemical mechanism. And when you then take out the extra fat, you take out the extra fluid, and you concentrate this in a hard block of opioid-like peptides that we call cheese, isn't it any wonder then that like we crave that? Literally, Dave, come on, man. I've seen people who have withdrawal symptoms when they take cheese and bread out of their diet. Seriously, they'll say like, yeah. you know, I'm craving a grilled cheese sandwich. I'm dreaming about it. They'll get the shakes. It's like, it's, I, it's I walk amazing. around like this if I quit eating gluten, like I have to slap my veins. It's, <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah. So true, uh, man. So true. Years ago, when I was working on on my nutritional stuff and yeah. my own personal, like like what works for me, I'd gone mostly gluten free. I'm like, I acknowledge it was bad for me, but I didn't understand that mostly doesn't count. It, it, it's sort of like, well, yeah. I, I almost quit crack and I almost quit heroin. I only, I only shoot it up on on Fridays. And You're that's almost pregnant. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Friday night, I would go to Burke's Restaurant, which is yeah. my favorite steakhouse in Silicon Valley, and yeah. Maurice, the head chef there, I've known him for years. And they have one grass-fed steak on the menu. I'm like, ah, oh, grass-fed filet mignon. Mm. But they have also the best like sourdough crusty oh, French bread oh, ever. Yeah. And they would yeah. use real butter. So oh, I'm like man. four containers of butter and a oh. loaf of bread. And I'll just have that. And it was my one <laughs> cheat for the whole week, right. you know, that cheat day thing. Yeah. And I would notice it took me like two years to figure this out. But I'd be like, man, if I have a whole loaf on Friday, maybe it's Saturday if I go there again. And I would go there a lot. It would be like. Maybe I'll just have one piece. And then Tuesday, maybe I'll just have two pieces. And I was just like someone smoking. I'll just have oh, one. Yeah. And then you have oh, three. Yeah. And yeah. if you just quit it, the addictive effect really does go away. Yeah, a couple weeks. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. So it goes down. Your new book is called The Elimination Diet. And, yeah. I, and I followed a classical one with, you know, for the course of a year, eliminating for four days at a time years ago to, to understand what was going on with me. And you've written some much more advanced things than that in your book. Absolutely. But 
what's the amount of time in mm. the elimination diet book or the one you read you wrote for gluten elimination to get you past the craving and then to get you past like the other biological effects of gluten yeah man so, you know, the bare bones minimum we need is about uh, 28 days to really get uh, to a point where you're going to notice the reactions when you're adding it back in. I suggest actually in my <clears throat> book that you wait until day 50 to start adding this stuff back in because really it takes that amount of time before people really get how much they're under a fog how yeah. much they are not as focused and as sharp as they could be, how their energy level could be higher. I mean, the comments I get all the time at the end of the elimination diet is, I feel 20 years younger. Oh my gosh, I had no yeah. idea that I had memory left. I had no idea that I could <laughs> think ahead like to what I'm gonna do next month and be totally positive and excited about it. You know, all these things about brain function. So yeah, bare bones minimum 28 days, prefer 50 days just for the, the gluten stuff, right? But what happens in this program is you're right, I get rid of all of the things that I have seen in clinical practice for 10 years that have been contributing to people's joint pain and whatnot. So yep. gluten, dairy, eggs, yeast, corn, soy, nightshades, the list goes on for a little bit. And what I would say is, if you take all those foods out at the same time, then the immune system can calm down. Then you feel amazing. Oh, but if you just gosh. take out wheat, but you leave cheese, what happens? Oh, okay. There are studies, <laughs> there are studies that are just fascinating. They take this out. You can do an intestinal lavage in people who are reacting to gluten with dairy, and you can put those same immune cells in exposure to dairy proteins and have almost an identical inflammatory response in 50% of the people. So 50% of the uh, percent of the people, if you take out the gluten and you don't take out the dairy, you still got pain, you still have discomfort, yeah. you still have mood disorder. So, you know, Sid Baker works at the Autism Research Institute. You know, he always says, if you're sitting on two tacks <laughs> yes. and you take one out, do you feel 50% better, right? No, you still have a tack in your bum. So, you know, take them all out and the pain goes away, right? And just, just to give you an idea of what you were talking about earlier, you know, I, I need to get it all out. Otherwise, I still have issues, right? Alicia Fasano, he works at the Autism Research Institute. And he had this comment. We did an interview. And I said, you know, Alicia, here's what I'm finding in my clinical practice. I'm finding that when people do a little bit of cheating, it totally keeps their results away. Like they don't yeah. ever fully let go of their inflammation, their pain, their skin disorders. And I said, what do you think about this statement? Do you align with this? 100% effort equals 100% results? And he said, Tom, 99% effort equals zero results. And I'm like, oh, oh, I don't see that. I see that when people reduce a little bit, right? They actually find benefit. But yeah, re reduction helps. You're, you're right, right about that. Yeah, but his argument is, look, if your immune cells are getting excited every time you eat, even though you don't have the symptoms outwardly, you may still be having a brewing inflammatory response in your intestinal tract. And or your brain. Or, right. <laughs> well, and which are the same thing, right? We yeah. now know. Oh, good point. Yeah, that you have neuronal connections in the intestinal tract. We now know that you might be feeding certain organisms that talk directly to those neurons and change brain function. So yes, 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 right? So you really got to get it all out. And, and people have a hard time with that. They say, but it's a food. I can have a little bit. It's not going to. And I say, okay, well, imagine this then. This is how your immune system works. You're sitting on a plane, which you do often, Dave. You're sitting on a plane. Someone five rows back from you starts coughing horrendously, right? Oh, 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 right? The thoughts immediately in your mind, maybe not you because you're dosing up on all sorts of stuff to prevent that, but other people, yeah. <laughs> other people are going to say, oh man, I'm going to get that. I'm totally going to get yeah. whatever that is. I'm now exposed. I'm going to, did it take a, a muffin sized, you know, chunk of someone's sputum to like get exposed <laughs> in your body before you came down with the flu? No, it's like little teeny particles, right? That's all it takes to excite the immune system. So little teeny exposures can go a long way when it comes to food as well. You're, you're totally right about that. And one of the things that I would love to eliminate from diets entirely is, is the idea of a cheat day because it's so harmful. I, I, in, in my work, I recommend a refuel day where you might change the ratios of macronutrients but just because you're having a day where you eat a lot of carbohydrates doesn't mean that you're eating a lot of opiate-based carbohydrates or proteins. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you're eating hydrogenated fat and you know Snickers bars and whatever other 
you know, garbage that you used to crave, partly because of the immune stuff that you just mentioned, but also just because then for the next four days, you have food cravings and brain fog and you're kind of cranky and you don't get you don't get all the benefits you're looking uh, you're looking for. Oh my gosh. And and that's your 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 deal, right? I mean, your whole thing is to elevate people to another level, which you've done yeah. eloquently. And oh, that's you, exactly John. exactly what this diet does. This diet helps you to figure out which foods are contributing to your symptoms. The whole deal with the elimination diet is we want you to eliminate the symptoms that don't serve you. We want you to find out which foods rock in your particular biochemistry. That's the whole goal. This is not a lifelong diet. This isn't something you do every single day. This is something you do as a diagnostic tool for yourself, an empowering tool for yourself. You find uh, we, out what works, and once you do then, you bring yourself, you elevate yourself to that next level. And then once you're at that next level, it's addictive. That feeling awesome is something you're gonna seek out more. And next thing you know, you're gonna seek out awesome relationships, you're gonna seek out awesome work, you're gonna seek out your life's mission. It's amazing, but when people, people are just cowered down and they're experiencing pain and they don't have mental acuity and things aren't working well for them, they're not alive. You know that. You try and help people mm -hmm. get out of that place. And so spent, once the, yeah. It's I spent way too much of my time in that place, my, of my life in that place, and that's, that's a bit of a problem. We all have. And that's the reality about, you know, finding out what's keeping you there. And why wouldn't you look at food? Because the reality is you're going to bring in 25 tons of food through your mouth through your lifetime. And the biggest suspect for irritating your body anywhere is going to come from your food entering your intestinal tract, interacting with your immune system there, right? Because we're now right. noticing that uh, it's no longer called the immune system. It's called the microbial interaction system. So wherever you have the highest concentration of microbes, you're going to have a lot of immune cells and or potential of exposure to microbes. So it's like, whoa, all right. So if I want to keep my immune system, my microbial interaction system calm, let's keep my gut calm because that's where the vast majority of those yeah. cells are. It, it's true. And, and if you're putting stuff in your gut that doesn't work for you, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> now, the... Your elimination diet book and, and mine, I'd, I'd recommend people read your book um, if they're interested in, in going deeper on what works for me. And, and as, as people who are hacking their own biology, like you got to know your personal food plan. Yeah. And I, I, I've spent years trying to dumb things down, not yeah. because people are dumb, but because there's so much information that you want to just compress it enough that without having to study like you have for 10 years uh, that you can grok it. Yeah, and I, yeah. I came up with a list of suspect foods and you and I would agree. Those are the things to eliminate to see which ones are making you weak. Yep. But the one where I was on the fence and I, I'm still on the fence about this is egg yolks, particularly raw egg yolks. Ah, do yeah. so many fantastic things for your, your cell membranes, your brain, for your lipids, for your gut uh, that I put them in the, the bulletproof food section as long as the eggs are good and carefully done. But like you said, they're one of the top eight most reactive foods. Yeah. And I, I was on the fence there. And you you recommend eliminating eggs. I recommend you test yourself with um, heart rate changes at, before and after a meal to Pulse see if testing, it works. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, any thoughts there specifically about eggs, given that they're a superfood, but they also are potentially allergens? How do you handle that? Well, you know, the elimination diet is designed to determine what's working, what isn't working. So for this particular diet, you take them out and then you add them back in. Mm -hmm. So you will determine at that particular time if you have symptomology, you're welcome to do laboratory analysis if you'd like as well, but they are removed in the diet. I am not going to even question <laughs> the fact that they're dense with nutrients at all, yeah. but the, the whole purpose of the diet is to identify what may or may not be exciting your immune system. And the reality about eggs is interesting, right? Because gluten and dairy, I don't find to be as what's called transitory. I don't find that if someone has a reaction to them, that those reactions go away quickly. Right? Mm -hmm. You might have a, a lifelong issue. What I do find, though, is in some people with eggs, it can be transitory. Meaning, once they've taken out the foods for a while, once they've healed their gut, they've worked on some sort of repair program, maybe adding in particular amino acids, nutrients they've been deficient on to calm down and repair their immune responses, then they might be able to tolerate the eggs again. So it's not a death sentence by any means. This is just yeah. like, hey, let's figure out. Let's figure out if it's the thing that's causing your eczema. Let's figure out if it's a contributor for your migraines. That's all this is. That's all it is. 
So yeah, absolute nutrient density, phenom. Now, immune excitability, it's going to depend on the person. And it, it, that's what's annoying because everyone in health, ranging from the the, the radical raw vegans, and I, I've been one of those, yeah. all the way over to you know the <laughs> carbohydrates are nothing that you should ever touch. And I've I ate only one serving of broccoli a day for three months, and the wow, rest of it like fat and protein. I'm like, I'll be like an Eskimo, but I don't have seaweed. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, I got an egg allergy during that diet. Oh, wow, man. I couldn't make enough lining for my stomach. The stomach is lined in mucus. And I didn't have enough polysaccharides, that would be sugar right. or carbohydrate, right. to make mucus. So my eyes were dry. My sinuses were dry. But um, I got a permeable gut from that. So I got actually allergies to several foods I reintroduced at the end of that diet. Like that was a failed experiment in nutritional Ooh, ketosis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But – so I'm actually working on eliminating the egg allergy right now. It's kind of funny we're talking about it. I didn't yeah. think we'd go there. But <laughs> the, the interesting thing that happens there is that it is highly variable on a personal basis. It's also variable on a time basis. Oh, yeah. And it's also variable on a food quality basis, right? Have you seen people react to GMO grain versus non-GMO grain? Although grain is grain. But that's maybe a bad example. But No, it's not like, a great example. You're dead what, what on it. What do you do though? Like, okay, this broccoli wasn't fresh and it knocked me, knocked me out and this broccoli was fresh and I felt amazing. Do you see that? And how big of a factor is food <laughs> freshness and quality? Uh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to add to that and mm -hmm. I'm going to say, you know, yeah, man, looking at the, the specific variety of a particular food could cause oh, a yeah. reaction or not, whether or not you're in a stressful situation could cause a, re a reaction or not. There are so many variables, Dave, you know, it's, I mean, it's life. It's complex, man. We're talking about millions of factors leading to a state of dis-ease, right? It's allostatic load. You hit a particular threshold and you tip that balance. And now someone's in a state of dis-ease. So yeah, potentials. But here's the thing you did not mention, which you, well, you hinted at, but should be focused on, I think, intensely, which is, you had touched on it with GMOs. You had said, you know, hey, is it possible that somebody could be reacting to GMOs? And the reality, Dave, is that what is a GMO? So sure, it might have altered peptide structures. Yes, it might have altered starch presentation. It's genetically modified. That totally makes it a potential epitope altered substance, meaning how it's presented to the immune cells could be changed and therefore it could be more reactive. Totally, totally. But there's another factor, man. And this happens with all foods these days, whether you're talking broccoli or anything else. And that is we're living on a planet that has 87,000 plus industrial agricultural chemicals, industrial chemicals for fuels, pharmaceuticals, whatever we're looking at. And what we're seeing coming out of Artie Voidani's lab and uh, Datis Karazian is emphasizing as well now, is that when you have chemical levels around that are elevated, they can actually change your antigen presenting cell behavior. They can change the presentation of proteins to your immune system in general. So we might be because a chemical laden food, maybe it has a pesticide, maybe it has some sort of chemical on it due to packaging, a plasticizing agent, whatnot, BPA, phthalates, that that particular reaction could be completely altered in the human. So we have to take into consideration now as we're putting in, you know, in the United States, we're doing 74 billion pounds of chemicals are imported or produced in the United States, 74 billion pounds every single day. So if you start doing the math on that, you start no, saying... On, that, that doesn't actually, like, I don't know that we have the ability to transport that many, unless CO2 or something like like. We, we can't move that many billion pounds in container ships. <laughs> well, no, like that saying? number doesn't pass the smell test. Ah, uh, this is coming from the American Academy of Pediatrics. It was the actual chemical analysis done by the United States government. So yeah, I would check it out because it'll shock you. The reality okay. is this number did not include pharmaceuticals, fuels, pesticides, and food additives. So these are some of the four largest classes of chemicals. And you say to yourself, how is this even possible? But you look at 16 billion pounds of BPA produced every single year. You look at the 2012 to 2013 chem reports from some of their profit analysis. And they say, we just increased our sales of BPA by 750 million pounds. You start adding up the individual chemicals. And however shocking this may be, however you and I, as, as people who are concerned about chemical exposure, will immediately shut it down and say, no, that's not even, that's not even a, a, a possibility. 
that's not even do the investigative work, man. It turns out there's like, oh my gosh, you add up these numbers and it's true. So it's absolutely crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Got what it. I would I, say is- I, I still suspect that some of them are double counted because you bought this chemical, you imported it, you added it and you made this chemical just, just because of that. If it was an annual number, I'd buy it on a daily number. Eh, check what, it out. All right, I'll, I'll check that out. But I, I, I think what the point here that really I don't want to lose is that there's a ton of these chemicals. We have no idea what they do to our immune systems. And okay. we know in some cases that they change the way your immune system reacts to food. Mm. So, exactly. Not to mention, what is the immune system again? The immune system brain. is the microbial interaction system, right? So it's our sixth sense. We have our, our fingers to touch things. We have our eyes to see things, smell. We want to determine what's friend or foe in the environment. We want to determine, can I get something out here to preserve myself, make myself thrive, survive, food, danger, all those things. We want to sense our environment. But it turns out that the immune cells are specifically designed to interact with bacteria and viruses, fungi. You know, all the things that we know can potentially either cure us or kill us in the environment, right? So what happens when you start putting on parabens, a preservative in your skincare cream, or your triclosan as a hand sanitizer on your hands, and you ingest some of this stuff? We see the rates of eczema, asthma go up, all the sensitivity diseases. We actually see food sensitivity responses go up in individuals that have these chemical exposures. Uh, this is one of those reasons we have a rule in my house that's like, if you wouldn't eat it, you shouldn't put it on your skin. <laughs> yeah, man. Right. Um, yeah. So that means apparently to my kids, they just rub chocolate all over their face, but oh, <laughs> they, they missed the point here. But <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so yeah. it's it, it's an interesting point, too, because the topic of the documentary that I'm coming out with, uh, or next, I guess, soon this year called Moldy is looking at what those agricultural chemicals did to the fungal biome in our soil. Yeah, it rises Because what's going in our mm -hmm. gut comes directly from the soil. Absolutely. And since we don't live in dirt floor places anymore, it's actually the, the biome in your home right. that influences things. Um, and I'm, I've even developed like probiotics for the home that you put in your environment, not nice. in. Nice. And, and those, are, those are so important and it's just avoided. But the reason we have to do this is because 35 years ago, these chemicals took – soil molds that were always not so good for us and made them 500 times more toxic. Yes. So what's growing in your drywall now, it makes 500 times more toxins. And mm. it's not that the chemicals made you weak. The chemicals pissed off Mother Nature. And Mother Nature's like, oh, yeah, let me clobber you right back. The adapt or die. So what and does not so, kill you makes you stronger. And yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. It, it's, it's a good cause for concern. And it's one of the reasons that I, I just restored the gravel pit on my, my property and we're turning into an organic farm. Like I want to be around a healthy biome in my soil because nice. I want my kids around that. And maybe I'm obsessive. Yeah. Actually, I just like to feel good all the time. I don't think that's obsessive. I, and I'm willing to go to extreme lengths for that. But hey, uh, it, it's, it'd be easier for me to live in LA than to live on Vancouver Island, but I do this for a reason. The science right. is there, man. No, I think mm -hmm. you're brilliant because the reality is when you start looking at any disorder, when you're looking at obesity, when you're looking at type 2 diabetes, when you're looking at arthritis, when you're looking at anything, really, you look at anything, what are you going to find? What you're going to find is a lack of biodiversity in the microbiome. You're going to find there are some missing microbes. You read that book, that Stephen Blazer book? It's awesome. Missing microbes. He basically says, many of the diseases and disorders we're experiencing in developed countries are due to our massive use of antibiotics, our massive use of sanitation-based chemicals, right? One of the biggest class of chemicals on the planet people neglect, for example, are the chlorination-based chemicals we use in our water supply. Yeah. Yeah. So you say, okay, well, if we're sterilizing the environment, we're going to be missing certain types of microbes. And it turns out, you know, one of my colleagues, Dr. Jim Adams at the Autism Research Institute, he published a really neat paper showing that 20 to 40% alteration in the microbiome of kids with autism. Blazer mentions and others in Epidemic of Absence, another great book about the microbiome, yep. we're seeing that the, you know, there's a possibility that up to close to a third of the indigenous microbiome we'd find if we lived, you know, how we used to live, exposed to the animals and the dirt and everything else in the environment, are now missing. They're now extinct in some people's systems. And when you're missing those microbes, you don't get the nutrients that those mm. microbes would per, uh, provide for you. And then you also don't get the protection they provided from some of the pathogenic or harmful organisms. 
So we're seeing more cases of SIBO. We're seeing more cases of, of overgrowth of pathogens. I, I remember this time I, I was in Nepal, uh, which is over there by Tibet, and I'm trekking you know, three, four days away from the nearest road, and, and you stay in these little guest houses. And I had this nice lunch, and I, I was mostly gluten-free, but like when you're, you're like really hungry, they have this Tibetan bread that's r- ridiculously good. Yeah. Um, and also, like I was eating so much at the time, I was like, "All right, I'm just going to eat whatever I can because you're at high altitude." And yeah. And this lady makes it this little, like, most unsanitary thing you could ever imagine. And lady makes it, and she walks out of the kitchen, and she comes back, and she has both hands full of fresh cow manure, like <sighs> full on like this. And she packs it around the herbs that were in our food, like right in the garden, and she goes back into the mm-hmm. kitchen. And oh, I'm just like, "What?" And, and the thought in my mind was. How is it possible that these people aren't all dead? Because clearly there's no running water here. Like this woman, yeah. like she probably wiped her hands on her shirt yeah, and went absolutely. back to cooking, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yet I didn't get sick. I was taking probiotics and everyone else on that trip eventually did get sick. I didn't because I was doing grapefruit seed extract and I was taking a soy-based organisms, um, no problems even with like street food in the middle yeah. of nowhere. Yeah. But okay, <laughs> that was just an example of how an indigenous person, she was probably 85 or 90, like she's this old lady still able to bend over and pick up things and to cook and to, you know, do her thing. Uh, there is something going on there that in the West we think is impossible. That's not impossible. It's totally, you're, you're onto it. How many cases of antibiotics do you, do you think she had in her lifetime? Uh, probably none. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, the birthing process itself is fascinating, right? Because you come through a vaginal canal and as you're coming through the vaginal canal, a baby's head will press against the mother's cecum. And the mother's cecum then will evacuate some of the fecal matter that has been brewing in the mother's cecum for the last trimester of her pregnancy that completely shifted and became far more vigorous right before birth, as if she was expecting to pass some of that on to her offspring. Baby in the squat position is born, head up, mouth open, so there's a likelihood of having some of that exposure happen at birth. You know, I don't know what had happened. I don't know what, how Freud was always like, you know, come on, there's a reason why you have these oral fixations, these anal fixations, whatever it is during certain times of life. And now the microbiologists are saying, oh my gosh, he was right. They make sense. We were trying to inoculate our systems. We're trying to expose ourselves to this incredibly beneficial soup of life around us that will protect us from disease, that will help us, you know, form nutrients from our diet. So it's, it's, it's amazing, man, how complex the microbiome is. It's, it's its own little universe. You know, when, uh, when our children were born, uh, when they first um, attached uh, to uh, my wife Lana's nipples, yeah. we actually sprinkled a little bit of Bacillus infantilis, which yeah. is the right probiotic for babies. We actually put it on her nipples yeah. so that literally in the first feeding, our kids were getting some of the, the healthy bacteria that are species appropriate for humans, for kids. And they don't do that in the hospital. Instead, they do things like smearing antibiotic ointment on your <laughs> eyes in case your mom had gonorrhea that was active. Yeah. And in California, that's actually the law. Yeah. Unless you like really go out of your way, they'll just do it in a birthing center or in a hospital yeah, really because that's just, yeah. hey, your mom might have been, you know, someone who had a serious STD. So just in case, let's just kill the bacteria. And man, we got to get away from that. Or they'll, if you're strepi positive, they'll actually, d- during the birthing process, give you some uh, antibiotics. And there are some nice reviews showing that perhaps the protection isn't what we imagined it to be. And at the same time, I did an interview with uh, an immunotoxicologist, uh, Dr. Rodney Dietert, and he said, look, come on, you know, if we're doing these interventions, these sanitizing interventions during the birthing process, we stop a human from completing themselves. He says, human organisms, what are we? You know, we're outnumbered one to 10 by microbes. Our genes are outnumbered 150 to one, right? So it's like, oh my gosh, we have so much influence. A new study just came out, what, four days ago, showing that the DNA from the microbes actually alters expression of our own DNA, which is fascinating. So we say, wait a second, we're not just human. We have a genome that's like less complex than worms. It's less complex than fruit flies. So what are we relying on to form these complex biochemical organisms that we are? We're relying on microorganisms to complete ourselves. They're now calling us humans superorganisms. 
So yeah, to interfere with that process doesn't seem to make sense. Well, I'm I'm a little skeptical of of that. Hmm. I I feel like we had this this time when you know bacteria are bad, bogged them with antibiotics. You know, World War Two. You know, changed the world with sure. sulfur drugs, right? Sure. And then we go over here to like, oh, the biome, the biome. Okay, those little bastards in your gut can kill you. Sure. Even the healthy ones are not working for your best interests. They're working for their best interest. And you're a walking <laughs> bag of a medium for them to grow in. And right. They will, Who's in charge, right? Well, yeah. And, yeah. and one yeah. of the things that, that frankly annoys me mm. um, about these bacteria is fasting induced adipose factor. And I don't know if your work has brought you across mm. this. Um, but I wrote about this in, in the Bulletproof Diet. And one of the things I could not explain <laughs> was why when I cranked my calories up to 4,000 to 4,500 calories a day, stopped exercising and cut my sleep to five hours a night, figured I would gain like a few pounds, show that I gained only a little bit when I should have gained buckets of fat. And look, the calories in, calories out doesn't work. What I did is I grew a six pack and I felt really good. And I did it for two years while I got Bulletproof started while I was working full time as a senior executive. Okay. <laughs> now, why was it, why did that happen? Why do people sometimes lose a pound a day, but not everyone? And the reason is that the gut bacteria, when they get sugar, certain species, the, the firmicutes, you know, the, the fat people bacteria, and that includes lactobacilli, they when they get a when they get sugar, they're like, oh, we better make our host store extra fat in case we need it to keep the host alive. So your liver makes fasting induced adipose factor, but then the bacteria tell you to make extra, which gives you a fat ass for their benefit. Like the fat ass wasn't to make me attractive to the opposite sex. It didn't serve me. And when I modulate my food intake to basically bonk all those bacteria on the head and then feed them with polyphenols like you would find in broccoli or God forbid coffee. Um, then what happens is you shift the ones who don't make fasting induced adipose factor and all of a sudden the what for me was years of obesity got much easier to hack and yet the lactobacilli are also the most commonly promoted things in the body so it, it feels like we owe it to ourselves to at least understand those little bastards in there and some of them might be our friends but only if they behave themselves and if they're not our friends i'm like i'm gonna make life really hard in my gut biome for the guys who don't serve me that's awesome. Yeah, that's funny, Dave. So the, the interesting piece that you're mentioning, too, is brilliant. And that is you're talking about certain things that shift the species that you can consume in your diet. Yeah. So you had mentioned polyphenols. You had mentioned plants. I'm, I'm going to get a little bit more intense and say, you know, you and I, we live up here in the beautiful Northwest, right? I'm, I'm hanging out in the woods. I wild harvest. I'll be going to get some nettles later today. Sweet. I, anytime I go outside, roots, fruits, and shoots, okay? I'm taking Oregon grape and I'm, you know, getting the, the actual berberine alkaloids coming from it. I'll be eating the wild lettuce that's coming up right now. I'll be eating the bitter crest, the cardamine flexuosa. And the reality is if you're outside and you are an indigenous person, you will be consuming bitter, tannin-rich, alkaloid-rich, yes. polyphenol-rich foods all the time. You're doing berries, you're doing whatever you're doing out in nature, natural foods, not these hybridized, nonsensical things we see on our grocery store shelf. Hybridized foods will not have any of this stuff. You go outside and you watch the average kid, if they're consuming a standard American diet, forage. They'll put something in their mouth and they go, no, no, ah, ah, <laughs> right? But we now know that these chemical compounds, you know, interfere with something called quorum sensing, right? The communication between the microbes to form biofilms and colonies mm -hmm. so they can evade your defenses, right? We know that rosemary is eloquent. We know that actually peppermint is brilliant about breaking apart and stopping the forming of these. So a lot of the culinary herbs that have been passed around through generation to generation and generation are actually microbial modulating herbal compounds. So there, there's no mistake why we have holy basil. There's no mistake why we have all of these bay leaves and whatnot. They are there for microbes, parasites. They're supposed to keep our system in balance. And without those, you do these acellular carbohydrate rich meals with lots of sugar and flowers and everything else. Of course, you're going to feed all of these organisms, and of course, it's going to throw everything asunder. It makes sense. It, it, I love it that you're mentioning those specific things. Um, my kids are five and seven, yeah. and we have an, an herb garden. In fact, we're 
turning it into a farm, right? Yeah. But one of the problems with the garden is they go through there all the time and they'll like pull off the top of the rosemary plant and just eat the rosemary. Yeah. And then they'll go to the oregano and strip the leaves like like monkeys and just eat it. Yeah, and that's me, man. I got them all the time. All yeah, the time. It's just, and it's like we better plant extra because we're not even going to get to bring it in and dry it. And if it is dried, they will walk up to a dried stalk of oregano and they'll strip it off and just eat it like like chips. And I, it, I know it's good for them. It's also hard to grow enough herbs when you have like little <laughs> herb eating machines like that. <laughs> they take out the new growth all the time. Yeah, but, they do. It, yeah. But it does modulate the bacteria and, and it does so many other things. Mm. But you and I are not living the way almost everyone is listening in their true. car in traffic right now so to this true. podcast yep. does. How do we translate our relatively bizarre ancestral patterns into something that someone who lives a normal life can do? Like, like what are your recommendations there? Absolutely. So one of the quickest ways to get people connected with life is to experience life. So if you can get someone to actually grow something, they will start to experience the wonder of growth itself, life itself. So if you can start something from seed, like broccoli seeds in your kitchen, for example, I highly recommend it. The bitter compounds will be beneficial for microbes. Uh, gosh, I mean, there's research on showing you can actually cure H. pylori infections with just broccoli sprouts alone. Um, you can ingest those for increased antioxidant detoxification function. But man, it's, it's the process. It's just taking those seeds, sprouting them. I've got videos on my website you can check out on, on how to sprout. Uh, broccoli give sprouts. me a URL. We're going to put that at the end yeah, of the show yeah. and in the show notes. But just yeah. people driving want to know it. Whole Life Nutrition. Just think of Whole Life Nutrition. Dot net. Okay. So whole life nutrition dot net. So check it out. Yeah. And then the other thing is a lot of the things we're talking about right now, rosemary, it's not that difficult to grow. It, it's more difficult than the mint families though, the oregano, the peppermint. Oh my gosh. You just get a little start from a nursery, an organic start, and you put it careful where you put it. But if you put it in a planter box on your balcony, in your window, in your kitchen, somewhere, and watch that thing grow and make sure it gets enough water and make sure it has decent soil. You know, the amazing connection you have with that process, you know, babying your little plant, watching it, taking a little leaf occasionally throughout the day can be so life-changing. Not only are you like participating in that wild foraging per se, but you're also connected to where it's coming from. And then you kind of like, well, where's the rest of my food coming from? Maybe I need to think about the sourcing of anything. You know, it starts getting you in the process of being connected with your food and where it comes from as well. That, that is awesome advice. Yeah. All right, now let's say you travel a lot. You live in a small apartment in LA. I mean, can't you just like buy oregano capsules? Can you Absolutely. just buy turmeric capsules? It still works, doesn't it? There's really great data on enteric coated uh, peppermint oil. There's phenomenal data on curcuminoids. Uh, absolutely. Are you kidding me? Rosemary? Absolutely. So it doesn't really matter per se. If you're going to not have access to the fresh stuff, you can still get benefit. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's all over the place, man. I read research on that all the time. Um, I've been using uh, turmeric, uh, various forms of it, but for probably 15 years for its anti-inflammatory things. And it, it absolutely works. And, and some species or some preparations absorb 10 or 20 times better than others. So even the variables of how something is delivered into your body changes how you absorb it. Just like the, the broccoli. I know you're like probably the broccoli whisperer, <laughs> but like if you put butter on your broccoli, you get more of the, of the vitamins from the broccoli. Like you actually can absorb them better or any other kind of fat. Guacamole works pretty nice as well. Um, stuff like that. Like it's, it's such a complex system that boiling it down to a set of best practices that are, are most likely there, even if we aren't a hundred percent certain, you know, how much oil per gram of broccoli is ideal for maximizing absorption yeah, yeah, of this yeah. fraction. Like, honestly, who cares? But how do you recommend in your book, the elimination, how do you rec recommend people deal with all those variables? And they're like, okay, I'm trying to eliminate some things and I'm going to put some stuff on my plate. Like what's the thought process you want someone to go through when they're going to you know, plate up? Yeah. Yeah. When you're plating up, well, you know, we actually have a really tough time recommending people eat out during the program. So we have a, we have a, a lot of, well, come on, man. You know how it goes. If you go to your favorite restaurant, I got a side of steamed broccoli at one restaurant in New Orleans, right? And what did they bring me? They brought me steamed broccoli 
but the dude scooped it from a macaroni spoon, right? So, <laughs> like, literally, there was macaroni and, like, little cheese stuff stuck on the bottom of my broccoli. I was like, excuse me, how'd this happen, right? I went to Andy Wiles' restaurant, you know, in Arizona. True, and, true Foods Kitchen, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, I had this, this uh, curry, right? Uh-huh. And I go to eat the curry and I lift it up and I was with a couple of physician friends of mine and, and someone looked at me and was like, hey, what is, is that a wheat kernel in your spoon? Right before I was eating, I was talking to him. I'm like, what? what? Oh my gosh, look at that. You know, there's actually a kernel of- uh, Sprouted of, wheat yeah, stuff. Yeah, man. So, you know, it's, you get glutened, you get contaminated when you eat out a lot. So we really focus on people having whole foods that they prepare themselves that are going to be as easy as possible. So I, I just finished up, for example, some uh, chicken sausages with fried plantain. I had some Savoy cabbage, some parsley, and uh, a little bit of uh, cilantro and some broccoli sprouts. So we encourage people to sprout broccoli. I show you exactly how to do that in your kitchen. It's super, super easy. Ramps up detox better than anything else. And that's the one food that if you can eat raw, will really shift things tremendously. It happens You're saying raw broccoli sprouts? Absolutely, yeah. It's the sulforaphane content, the sulfur-based content that you want. And, and things travel. I mean, all right, I'm, I'm going to tangent a little bit here. Sulforaphane, the sulfur-based compound that gives mm-hmm. you that diapery you know, smell when you're cooking it in the kitchen or your Brussels diapery, sprouts. Diapery, lovely. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, come on, I got five kids, man, you know, right? So, I'm, not, I'm not arguing. <laughs> yeah, right, right? So um, that particular sulfur compound is highly unstable. It's used by the plant to be a pesticide. So an insect bites the plant, and in doing so, it frees up an enzyme that breaks apart glucose from that sulforaphane. So it's stored normally with glucose attached. Sulforaphane glucosinolate is what it's called. So SGS, it's attached. And then once you bite into that, that activates that enzyme, separates the glucose, then you have the active free sulforaphane. Well, that particular enzyme that gives you the free sulforaphane is denatured when you get past 118 degrees. It's a protein denaturing, much like you denature the proteins in an egg white after you heat it past 118 degrees, you see it turn from, you know, trans, uh, lucent, almost transparent to being far more white, right? So that's the same process. You denature that enzyme, it doesn't work very well. You don't get the free sulforaphane, interestingly enough. So, you know, yep, keep that one raw. You're right, there are so many things to think about when it comes to individual foods, right? You were saying, carotenoids, for example, if you give butter with the vegetables, all the carotenoids are much better absorbed. But then things like sulforaphane, you know, you want them raw, lightly steamed, for example, to get it in. So we, we teach people, you know, and here's the thing, Dave, we, we, my wife makes all these amazing recipes. So we have a ton of great recipes in the book, but we also provide an online support program. And in that program, my wife walks you in the kitchen. She gives you videos, 24 cooking instruction videos. I coach you through some of the tips and tricks of, of getting through the diet and having a blast doing so, right? And I give you webinars as well. So people who come on those webinars, they get to ask me these questions. They'll say, hey, you know, someone told me that this particular food is best prepared as such. And I'll say, well, thankfully, I just read 16 articles on that. Let me tell you about that, right? So, you know, it's, it's fun. I get to do that interactive piece. There is a lot going on when you're thinking about what goes on your plate, but we try and make it as simple as possible. We give you menu plans. We give you the actual foods themselves. We show you how to make them. And then, wow, you know, not only do they blast through your taste buds and make you really excited about eating food again, but they blast through your symptoms and you can wake up and be a functional human again. It's awesome. So, so what... Uh, this is always a conundrum. Uh, yeah. There is something to be said for eating whatever you're going to have, some of it raw for the signaling mechanisms. Sure. Um, so, you know, as a former raw vegan, like you really, you get into this stuff. Yeah. yeah. There's also a, an issue with, with something like uh, raw broccoli. I, I used to eat giant bowls. I had to buy new bowls because you cannot get enough <laughs> calories as a raw vegan, at least a muscular, tall raw yeah, vegan. Yeah, man. These yeah. like yeah. ginormous bowls and they'd be full of like chopped up broccoli and cabbage. Yeah. And, Raw cruciferous vegetables inhibit thyroid function. Ah, uh, yeah. So, right? You, you <laughs> so know, how do you draw the line between, okay, a little bit good, like buckets of raw broccoli are probably going to mess you up. Love it, man. Love it. So uh, you know me, man. I, I dig. I'm, they, they call me the mechanism man in my functional medicine circles, right? So <laughs> um, I hung out and I did a, a, a TED Talk on broccoli, you know, broccoli, the DNA whisperer. And so I consulted with researchers at the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center, right? Johanna Lampe down at uh, University of Washington, as well as the, the team over at Johns Hopkins, Jed Fahey's um, crew over there. 
And I asked them, I said the same thing. I said, look, there are certain glucosinolates, not the sulforaphane, but there are other glucosinolates found in these cruciferous vegetables that seem to be goitrogenic, maybe inhibit the actual absorption of iodine, maybe impede thyroid function, right? And multiple mechanisms. So I said, what's the risk there? And they were really quick in saying, look, man, if you're not consuming two plus pounds of raw broccoli every day, have a predisposition for some sort of, uh, sort of iodine insufficiency or thyroid dysfunction, it's a mood point. Don't even stress about it. And Johanna was saying, yeah, you know, I'm giving people over two pounds of mixed raw and cooked per day, and I haven't seen alterations in thyroid function. So what I would say is uh, Jed Fahey, he from Johns Hopkins, he said, I think this whole thing came back from when cows were being fed um, milk after they would consume canola or rapeseed. And it used to be before it was hybridized, rapeseed had a tremendous amount of these sulfury-based compounds, and they had some goiter issues back then. And then there are parts of the globe where they don't eat anything but some goitrogenic compounds, and so it raised the alarm level. But we have to come back from that fear. The reality is the research does not support that if you're consuming less than two pounds of raw cruciferous vegetables a day, and you'd have to do that for six months or more, and then you have a predisposition for thyroid function or iodine insufficiency. So yes, there's a limit. I don't want you going out eating, you know, two plus pounds of whatever it's going to be, bok choy or arugula or uh, Brussels sprouts, or any of the crucifers. But, you know, if you're consuming them lightly steamed and you are having less than two pounds per day, relax a little, enjoy, have a good time. So I, I, I absolutely put some raw, raw cabbage on my salad and I'm happy to do that. But I, I did actually get thyroid dysfunction when I was a raw vegan. <laughs> I bet. Well, it sounds like you had to get a bowl. Yeah, you well, were doing I, the two pounds, man. I don't know how to get a couple thousand calories a day of yeah, raw yeah. vegetables without using an awful lot of blending and, and chopping and, and just eating. <laughs> um, so yeah. I, it was a problem for me. And I don't know if I was eating more than two pounds of just cruciferous. I ate you know, lots of other stuff too. Sure. But um, I, I think that, that there's... I question that that based on some of the the clinical nutritionists that I've worked with who have seen problems, especially with people on sustained long long periods of time. If you want to eat two pounds of broccoli for a month, I, I don't think it's gonna it's gonna do anything to you. Right. But if you do it, you know, on a regular more, basis. Sure. And what about raw kale? What's your take on that? I don't have a problem with raw kale as much. You know, um, some of the compounds are less than kale, including the sulforaphane. So the broccoli sprouts seem to be mm -hmm. la pièce de résistance, the tip of the top, cream of the crop, Mary Poppins is where we stop. And then you go down from there and you'll say, okay, well, yeah, you've got arugula and some of the cresses and then uh, radishes. And then, you know, you got kales. So kale is, is decent. Um, I don't have an issue with the raw kale as much. It doesn't seem to have the goitrogenic uh, glucosinolates as high or the sulforaphane as high. So raw kale. But once again, you know, yeah. everything in yeah. moderation. I mean, you don't want to be doing, you know, two plus pounds of, of raw anything all the time. I, I think two plus pounds of raw kale a day would be kind of dangerous. Um, <laughs> when the, the producer on my film was doing several meals a day with lots of raw kale and, and got kidney stones. And uh, yeah. there's the autism oxalic acid link yeah, and sure. there are high levels sure. of oxalate in lacy Water. kale versus yeah. dino kale. Sure, so I'm sure. like, look, in fact, there's a protocol on my website. Like, here's how to cook your kale. Yeah. Use some water, dump the water. Yeah. And yeah. the water has most of that. And you can even bind up the oxalic acid. Right? So it, it's one of those things where if you have a piece of raw kale, it probably won't bother you. But I also know people who eat a little bit of raw kale and they get joint pain from it. Yeah. And that's probably because they have a high oxalic acid load. And that's probably because of their gut biome. And that's probably because of their fungal biome. Because the fungus in your gut will also make oxalic acid. It's so complex. But... I, I am a little leery of excessive brassicas sure. in raw form, but I'm a huge fan of eating some raw brassicas for the signaling effects. And, and what about the pills? I, for 10 years, I've been taking uh, bio-dim and related things, diendomethane, I think, Dino one of the broccoli compounds that also contains sulforaphane in the, in the capsules because of the anti-cancer research. Yeah. So what... Um, What's your take on the capsule form of broccoli? Like, can I take my broccoli sprout extract because I was too lazy to sprout myself? <laughs> yes, you can, man. So uh, <laughs> the same team at Johns Hopkins University came out with the, uh, you know, SGS trademark uh, mm -hmm. product. And uh, that's used by two companies now. Thorn Research makes Crucera SGS. And then mm -hmm. Zymogen makes Oncoplex. So yep. the actual original broccoli seed extract is what that is. Um, that's been on the marketplace for quite some time, and that's been proven to actually have little higher levels of the SGS, the, the actual 
um, sulforaphane glucosinolate than some of the, the competitor products. They're at about 13%, and you see other people's vary between 7 3% and whatnot. So that, that, that's awesome. Yeah, you can take those capsules. Those are great. The DIM, the I3C, indole 3 carbonyl um, those two compounds are different than the, the sulforaphane, um, mm-hmm. but raw or lightly steamed. I'm not, I'm not pushing raw on everything. <laughs> light, lightly steamed um, actually has as much benefit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's what they'll recommend in, in some of the, the pharmaceutical or pharmaco- pharmacognosy research, as they'll say, you know, lightly steamed on the cruciferous. So yeah. um, absolutely, man, you can get it from supplementation. Mm-hmm. Cool. And, and count me in the, the lightly steamed with a little bit of shredded raw on top camp um, based we, on that reading that stuff. But but we I think we, we tend to we, we tend to think similarly there, although yeah. you might be a bit more accepting of the raw. But by the way, neither one of us has perfect evidence that says this like these are small tweaks. And if you're listening to this, it, try it. <laughs> <laughs> either one is probably a really good decision. Uh, so it's not about either one of us knowing or being perfectly right about that. Directionally, I think that we're uh, we're in full agreement. And best practices for this guy over here may be different than this guy over here. And just acknowledging there's a difference and seeing what works is is the core of being human. Let's bring some balance too, man. I love that. I love that. And the other thing is what they're finding in the research is you don't have to eat that much, right? I mean, if you're doing a quarter cup of broccoli sprouts and you do it five times a week, that's probably enough. I mean, the reality is that these chemical alterations that take place, they, they, they read portions of your genes that are ingenious, right? That take place, if you're eating five servings a week, the lasting effect, I mean, it's 72, 94 plus hours of effect after a single serving, man. So yeah, you're not, you don't have to eat them seven days a week at, at, you know, a pound plus a day. I mean, if a little's great, a lot more is better is the, you you know, American way, right? No, you just get those five servings in, right? So yeah, yep. man, I'm right there with you. Awesome. Well, we're, we're running up on the end of the show. This has been fascinating. Hopefully we didn't, uh, we didn't lose anyone by going deep into the, 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 the nooks and crannies of broccoli, <laughs> but it, it's just an example of how, you know, as geeks, we can really get into it oh, yeah, and, and talk about what is the best practice. And the idea of identifying perfect up here and looking at whatever you're doing down here, and like, how do you just move more in that direction? Not about identifying perfection. Because I know my broccoli is picked by one armed monks. <laughs> it, it's even better than your broccoli. It's just, sorry, man. We're, Dude, we're, you got me. You got me. Yeah, <laughs> like, mine have two arms, so whatever. Yeah. But it, it's like we can always be like slightly better, but it doesn't matter. Eat more broccoli, boom. Yeah. <laughs> from there, we can. Easy, easy, right? Love it. Well, there's one question that, that everyone on the show uh, answers at the end. And it's given all the stuff you know, not just from your profession, but just from life, your top three recommendations for someone who wants to perform better at whatever they do. Mm. So you want to kick more ass, do these three things. Okay. If you want to kick more ass, do these three things. Um, I would say consider the impact of your actions. And what I mean by that is, where's your food coming from? Where are the influences that you're feeding into your life, whether they are thoughts, whether they are foods, just consider where they're coming from. And be conscious of the fact that, you know, the the purity, the nutrient density is going to change depending on where they're coming from, how they're produced, right? So where are the thoughts coming from? Where are your ideas coming from? Where are your food sources coming from? That's an awesome one. Um, The other one is listen to your body. Listen, because it will start whispering to you in butterfly whispers, right? It'll start telling you things. You know, when you have that mild joint pain, that mild fatigue, when you start seeing those skin rashes, that's telling you something. Listen, listen, listen. If you have to... Take out some foods for a while to find out what's going on. If you have to add nutritional supplementation, whatever you have to do, just listen to your body. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's really, really important. And then above and beyond that, you know, I would say don't, don't trust, don't trust everything you hear, investigate for yourself, right? So when somebody says, oh man, why would you want to supplement with these neurologically supportive nutrients? You know, there's no data on that. There's no evidence on going gluten-free. There's no, you know, whatever. This, this particular chemical doesn't cause cancer or autism or whatever. I say, nonsense. Look at the data on all sides. Look at what you feel comfortable with and look at what you're not familiar with and try and find something there to prove yourself wrong. 
because you might find that there's some data on PQQ or CoQ10 or GABA or something that you know would shock you, or you might find that there's some little connection that you didn't think existed before. So how's that for some obtuse esoteric advice? I think that's wonderful advice, and uh, I, I appreciate you for, for sharing that. Oh, absolutely, man. Least I can do. All right. Tell me the title of your book, where people can find it, and give us your URL one more time, and we'll put all this in the show notes. There'll be a full transcript, and we'll do our very best to spell the names of all these strange compounds right, but no guarantee that my transcription team is going to get it all. We'll do our best. <laughs> okay. Name of the book. Super easy. The Elimination Diet. Standard functional medicine tool, everybody's yeah. using it, but it hasn't come out yet. The Elimination Diet. The website, wholelifenutrition.net. Blog, nourishingmeals.com. Free recipes, wife is amazing. So that's the best way to find me. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on the show. And uh, I look forward to the next time we get a chance to hang out in person and go out in the back of wherever we are and eat some sort of weeds yeah. growing in the backyard. It's going to be great. We'll find some fun stuff. A little <laughs> oxide daisy to make it sweet. We'll, we'll make up a brew, dude. It'll be great. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Tom. Have an awesome day. You as well, Dave. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed today's show, I'd appreciate it if you would do me the favor of going out and picking up Tom's book, The Elimination Diet. And while you're at it, there's this awesome book with an orange cover called The Bulletproof Diet. Pick that one up too. I'm still working on just letting people know about it. If you already have a copy, I won't hold it against you if you pick up another copy. So pick it up and give it to your mother or your father or your brother or your sister because there's a lot of knowledge in here. And you can do the same with Tom's book as well. The idea here is the people that you care about around you, they win when you get them to make a few steps in the right direction. So go ahead and do that. And man, I really appreciate it. And if you're really feeling extra generous, just full of gratitude because you just learned how amazing broccoli sprouts can be for you, then you can go to iTunes and click like on Bulletproof Radio. And then, man, you've made my whole day. Thank you. <laughs>